what stands out for you uh, about all team life most? You know, it's one thing that to create the event and have good speakers and useful information, but you also attract a really enthusiastic crowd. Uh, and so when I talk to engineers, layout engineers and other electrical designers, I find that um, they really love what they're doing and they are really keen and enthusiastic about learning more and uh, kind of going the next step. So the audience is a very enthusiastic audience. I don't know if you tried to select it on purpose, but you managed to attract uh, engineers that are really interested in, in this field and, and want to grow. And so coming to these kinds of events like Altium Live, this is a great opportunity. If you want to get curated content that is a high value and you have high confidence that, oh, okay, these are, are reasonable design guidelines or principles that will apply, um, you know, these kinds of events that you guys put on at Altium Live are useful uh, events for, for well-curated, valuable information. Fantastic. Yeah, that, that's exactly what we want to achieve, you know. Um, we, we, the goal is to, to, to help engineers become better at what, what they're doing or aspiring engineers to help them, you know, to, to get where they want to be. But what, what uh, I know you have the, those seven habits, with, uh, which I'm sure is a game changer for many engineers. But on top of that, what would you, what would you tell an aspiring student uh, to be mindful of, to make the most out of his, um, out of his path as an engineer. So at at, at CU, the University of Colorado in Boulder, um, I teach a couple different classes on to electrical engineers, and um, you know many times one of my classes is a graduate class on signal integrity, and I usually get them just before they're ready to graduate, and I I find a tendency among graduate students that uh, have been in school for you know twelve years for high school or up to high school four years for undergraduate, another two years for a master's degree. So they've been in school for, uh, what is it, 18 years, basically. Um, it's a habit, and they're used to that environment, and they think, oh my gosh, I'm not ready to graduate. I haven't learned enough yet. And, and I always tell them that that learning process never ends. Just because you get your degree, and that's the number one goal in, 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 when you're getting a master's, get your degree, and then go on from there, go into industry or, or get a job somewhere to apply it. I tell them that the learning doesn't stop when you leave the university. The lifetime, that, or the half-life, for information that you learn about current technology is maybe three years. That means if you're not constantly uh, learning and refreshing your, your knowledge about current technology, you're going to be obsolete in, in three or four years. And so learning has to be a constant, uh, constant process. But that's where the, the learning specific skills like you know the latest microcontroller or uh, library of, of commands for you know a, a new uh, uh, Cortex M4 uh, or uh, about uh, oh there's a new uh, PCI Express protocol that's come out you know learning those specific skills and that information that you need to refresh but I think it's important to have a set of core principles that you need to know as an engineer and and one of the the processes I've been trying to put in place at CU is identifying what I think are the, you know, I call them the, the broad-based skills that every engineer needs. Uh, and so I, have, I, I love lists. And so I have another list of the, what I think are the six most important broad-based skills that uh, every engineer should have. One is this idea of we, we learn a lot in the classroom. We, we you know, study the textbooks and we, we learn you know, how to solve Maslow's equations with all these boundary conditions and solve differential equations and, and we do all this analysis. But we have to recognize the reason we do that is to solve real world problems. And that transition from the, what you learn in class to how you use it in the real world is, uh, is an ongoing process. It's something you have to practice a lot. We don't teach that very well at, in the university environment. Um, and so I'm trying to instill that in my classes and have my students always, you know, the new age term is be mindful of it. That is, be mindful of when you do something in the real world, think about what are the underlying principles that's based on. You know, for example, when we design the layout, you know, one of the important things is about return path control. The, you you want to have a, a plane on the bottom so signals uh, see the wide plane. And so the reason you do that is to minimize the loop inductance of a signal return path. So another signal return path has low mutual inductance because it's the mutual inductance where you get the 
crosstalk. And so you learn, students learn about inductance in the classroom with the, the whiteboard, and they learn about the magnetic field lines and, and calculating the number of rings of, of magnetic field lines, and they get the inductance out of it. But they don't make the connection between that illustration on the board and calculating the line integral of E dot DL to get the magnetic field. They don't get the connection between that and here I've got a trace on the board and I've got a signal return back and that's a loop too. And so when we talk about some of the, the design principles, I try to relate that to the, the essential principles they learned in the classroom about what's going on. And it's the kind of thing that you can never practice enough. You can never pay it enough attention to what am I doing in the layout or what am I doing in the electrical design or the circuit design? What am I doing in the measurement? And how is that related to the fundamental principles? And, and at CU, we have an integrated technology learning lab. Uh, and it's a lot of equipment that students do a lot of hands-on labs. And, and the tagline uh, for the ITLL, it's a, a, a line from Confucius in 500 BC. The bottom line is, I do and I understand. That the way we understand the principles is by doing the hands-on part of it. Um, you learn a lot in the classroom, you know, listening to lectures, reading, and doing problems, but you don't really understand it until you're doing it. And that's where the value of, that's why we have the labs, that's why we have the hands-on opportunities. But it only works if you're mindful of what are the underlying principles that I'm using when I'm soldering a, a, a component on the board or when I'm uh, selecting the type of decoupling capacitor to put on the board? You have to be thinking about it and be mindful of the underlying principles that are driving those decisions. Because when you do that and you have confidence, I understand what's going on now, then you're your own expert. You're not listening to someone that told you, oh, you do it this way, you use a, a, a red LED instead of a green LED. Uh, why? Well, it's because I've always done it that way. Um, you you want to have an understanding of what the fundamental rationale is, the, the, the principles underlying the decisions you make. So that idea of always being mindful of how the, the, the classroom learning applies to uh, the real world is, is an ongoing process, and you can see that happening on a daily basis. I'll, I'll mention one other important principle, I well, two important principles that I try to instill in my students. Uh, one is uh, the correct use of an oscilloscope. It's such a simple, stupid thing. You think, an oscilloscope, how hard can that be? You've got a couple knobs, you just tweak the knobs, you see them on the screen. And yet, there are many wrong ways of using the scope. Uh, and seeing something, on it's really easy to see something on the screen. It's really hard to have confidence that what I'm measuring there isn't a lot of artifacts and is really giving me the valuable information I care about uh, with my device that I'm measuring. Uh, and so uh, I think it's uh, one of the important skills every engineer needs is to use a scope correctly. Um, and, um, and that is, you know, there's a certain methodology of setting up the vertical scale and the horizontal scale and learning the trigger. And once you do that, you practice at it, it's not a video game. It's not trying to tweak every knob as quickly as I can until I see, you know, something on the screen that's kind of sort of what I want. It's understanding what each knob is doing and setting it mindfully. Um, so it's good usage of the scope. And I hope that all the students that go through my class are masters of using the oscilloscope. Um, and, and then the last rule, I, there, there are six of them, but I just wanted to mention one last one, uh, and that is what I call rule number nine. It is probably one of the rules that I'm most well known for uh, because I think it is so important. And I, I show it off in all of my classes, all of my lectures, all of my students are well versed in it. And rule number nine is basically before you do a measurement or simulation, anticipate what you expect to see. Think about what should be the outcome. Um, because ultimately, uh, when you do a simulation or a measurement, you can never prove you're right. All you can do is demonstrate what I observe is consistent with my understanding. And uh, your expectation of what you expect to see based on how you understand the system is the number one most important consistency test you can do. And I invariably, I, I don't have a connector on well, or I'm not probing the point on the board I think I am, or I'm um, looking at one channel in the scope, but I, I'm connected to another channel. Invariably, I make mistakes. And the way I can identify, have I made a mistake is, 
it's not what I expect. There's a reason for it. And before you identify what that re before you use that information, you want to make sure it's consistent with what you expect. Don't go on unless you can get to that consistency point. And it's the same with simulation. It's so easy to get a result with a simulation. You push the run button, you're going to get a result. But it's really hard to have confidence the result I have is it doesn't have artifacts in it. You can never be absolutely sure, but at least you can do consistency tests. And that first test of is it consistent with what I expect to see, I think is the number one most important principle in, in engineering. And so those are three really important, I call them broad-based skills all engineers have, independent of the details of, you know, do you know the latest uh, uh, register commands for some microcontroller? Or do you know the latest protocol for USB 3.0 or 3.1? It's broad-based skills that apply for any engineering activity that, that you have. Well, thank you very much for sharing all these, all these tips and, uh, and valuable habits. Um, you, you say you, you, you like the lists that you have for your students. And, 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 but do you also have something for people like, like yourself, for mentors, of, of what they could do to, to share their experience and their knowledge with, with, uh, with students or ongoing engineers or other engineers? So, you know, this whole idea of having a mentor, for, for, I think, is a really important one. And when I talk to my students about when they're trying to decide what job to go to, I always tell them that one of the important things to look for is, is there someone uh, uh, available in the group they're going to start that they can, can be a mentor to them, they can learn from? A mentor, fundamentally, is, is a teacher. Uh, and so it's the same skills that a teacher uses. And I think one of the most valuable skills a mentor can have it, well, two, two important skills, you know, and I use these all the time as an as a, as a instructor, as a teacher. Uh, one is setting realistic expectations for um, junior engineers. That is, you want to have realistic expectations, high expectations, but you have to evaluate what that person's capable of. You don't want the expectations so high that they're unattainable. Um, but you want to ha have them grow a little bit. And so understanding what you can expect from someone. So you have to get to know someone well enough to understand, well, how quickly can they learn things? Um, where is their skill set? Where are they a little bit uh, deficient in? Where do they need to grow? Um, and so you need to identify at what level are they starting? What are they capable of doing? And where do you want them to be? So a mentor, I think, number one, needs to understand um, where the, their mentee is, uh, where they want them to be and have a realistic expectation of where they want to end up. And the second is, I think that it is really important to give everybody a chance to make mistakes. Because no matter how much you tell them, do it this way, because this is going to be the problem, no matter how much you tell someone about doing something a certain way, the way they really learn is by touching the stove and realizing, that, hey, that's hot. I'm not going to touch the stove. They have to make mistakes. And so when you're you know, I, I do this all the time in, uh, in the lab. I spend a lot of lab time with the students. And I see them struggling with the instrument or the scope. And it would be really easy for me to just go and say, no, it's, you push this button over here. No, that's where it is. But I always hold back because it's really important for the students to make that mistake and, and see, oh, I better not do that again. And I always tell them, you want to fail early and fail often. And the purpose of, uh, uh, of a class, of, of training, is to... Uh, help you go farther before you fail. You want to try to fail early and often, but if you plan well and, des and design for risk, plan for the risk, do risk reduction, then you won't fail as much and you'll make farther steps each time. But you have to accept the fact that you're going to make mistakes. Uh, and you know, the other line I always use is, an expert is someone who's made all the mistakes possible. And so you have to make some mistakes in order to learn from them. And so if you're a, a mentor, you have to give your, your engineer, your young colleague, an opportunity to make mistakes because those are going to be the most valuable lessons. You know, one of the things we do at the university is we try to create a safe environment for the students to make mistakes. When we, uh, when we do soldering or we blow things up, um, I make sure they wear safety glasses because it's okay to make a mistake and blow something up, but I just want to make sure you do it safely. And you know, it's kind of in that environment that I encourage students to think about what they're doing, try things, knowing they're going to make a mistake, um, let them make that mistake as long as they learn from it. And so what I grade students on is not did they 
how many mistakes they made, but did they articulate the mistakes they made so they understand them and are paying attention to what not to do the next time. So I would, I would rate those two qualities most and more for mentors, setting realistic expectations and providing a safe environment for um, their junior engineers to make mistakes in a positive way so they can learn from, from each one of them. That's, that's really, really good advice, yeah. So what would you tell your, your younger self if you, if you could go back and do things differently? You mean other than hold on to my Google stock? <laughs> <laughs> or my Yahoo stock? Or my Apple stock? Yeah, <laughs> Apple office. when it was 79 and oh, yeah. when it hit the bottom and, and then split factor of 10? <laughs> other than that? <laughs> uh, you know, I've lived a very uh, varied career uh, in, in my day. I started out as a, in graduate school, I, I did my PhD in cosmology and quantum optics. And, and relativity. And I mean, my mother even said to me, where do you expect to get a job after that? You don't go through the one ads and see cosmologists want to apply here. Uh, and so I, I recognized that, um, th that that wasn't a field forever for me, uh, but it was something I was really interested in at the time and it gave me good preparation. And I've recognized that, you know, I'm going to go through, I'm going to try things out and go through a number of careers. And I've probably had maybe, I'm on my maybe fifth or sixth career right now. I took a stint through, I was in managing groups and I uh, was in product development and, and as at Sun Microsystems managed technology programs. I wanted to, to uh, be a midwife to new technologies and I had that, those opportunities. I got into marketing, uh, technical marketing, um, and then product marketing, and then just a standard technical member of the research staff. And so I've had a chance to wear a lot of hats to try things out. And then, so. What excites you most about engineering? As far back as I can remember, um, what I am both amazed and thrilled with is this idea that I can sit in a windowless room and I can do a calculation of if I put this resistor and this capacitor together and this inductor together in this way, I can calculate the, what the, the resonant frequency, the ringing frequency is going to be when I send a transient. I can do a calculation here of some abstract thing in this, in this ideal world of models and simulations, and I can go to the lab and I can build that thing with physical components and do a measurement, and darned if they don't match really well. I mean, the idea that you can predict the behavior of real world effects, however complicated they are, in a relatively simple way. That connection between the, what, what it says it behaves in the textbook, if you apply it well, really does match the real physical world. I have to say, whenever, that's why I love, that's why we're for Teller and Lecrae. We, we make oscilloscopes. We do a lot of measurement stuff. And I love measurements because that's the ultimate anchor to reality. And you know, there's just as many ways of screwing up a measurement as a simulation, but when you get them both right, there's this thrill of, oh my gosh, I can take this compli complicated system here, I, I, I can predict it over here with some simple model, simple analysis, and darned if they don't match. And that, that idea that the world is predictable if you know how to apply those essential principles, and you can predict it to however high in accuracy you can measure. You can do it to 1% to a tenth of a percent. Uh, that, that idea that you can get such good agreement and prediction, I, I think is still astonishing to me that the world is, it is possible to, to be, uh, the, the physical world around us is really a predictable world and it matches these, this framework that we've developed over the last 400 years of, of science and engineering. So I think that you know, more than anything, it's not the, the building part. You know, some people are creators and makers, and they love inventing new things, and that's great, but I don't think I have that, that creative spark in me of, of creating a new device or a new machine, but it's that connection between, I can really measure something here and predict it, and they match. And it is just such a thrill that it's a, it's a power you have of understanding the real world in a, in a real quantitative way. Um, and so whenever I, that's why I love measurements, I love data. You know, some of my students are sick of all the time I talk about measuring data and displaying it well because so, I think it's so important and it's so much fun to do that comparison. Fantastic. So what are you predicting for the future of uh, technology? Ten years, where are we going to be? Oh, everything's going to be AI. <laughs> I, uh, I have to say I do have a few concerns about 
uh, you know, this today the the buzzword is uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, quantum computing is going to be the hardware technology for the for the future. But I I do have a concern about machine learning, and I see this in um, young students coming from high school even because they teach artificial intelligence, neural network design in in some high school advanced high school classes, and so I've talked to some of these high school kids that feel like they don't need to know these principles of of F equals MA or Maslow's equations or what the underlying behavior of, of a system is based on, on forces and angles and masses. They don't need to know that because all they have to do is build an artificial network. All they have to do is build this little machine learning code that will take a bunch of inputs and predict the outputs. They don't need to know the mechanism. And it worries me that they lose that connection between there are underlying simplified fundamental principles that are the basis of how a lot of things work. And there are a lot of effects. You don't, the right approach is not to build a neural network or apply machine learning to it. It's to apply the simple analytical principles to it. When you have a really complex system, you know, facial recognition, or um, I've seen some folks in the signal integrity world taking a design that's got 50 different parameters that you want to vary to find the optimum uh, uh, eye opening for changing a line width or a thickness or a trace length or um, uh, space in between traces. You have 50 different parameters. How do you explore design space? You can, you can use principles to get you close, but how do you optimize that? That's where machine learning, artificial intelligence comes in to help you explore the optimum design space. But getting you there initially, that's where the principles are. And I worry that we will focus too much on We'll just build a neural network to solve the problem rather than look for the underlying principles um, that, that really describe how, how the world works. So I, for the future, I, I think machine learning, artificial intelligence is going to take over as a, a software framework for solving problems. I think um, uh, virtual reality and, and augmented reality, huge opportunities. The science fiction book that I wrote, um, Shadow Engineer, that focuses or uses as one of the props augmented reality glasses. And so, you, you know, with them, you, with the RF interface, you're in constant communication. You see it displayed with a uh, voice recognition and synthesis interface. You interact with your glasses like a, a, a true personal assistant, or you can. So I see the uh, augmented reality as the, the, the real personal assistant. Um, I see neural networks, artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, as computation and mission, the development and the advance of, of quantum computing. I worry a little bit, but I think there's a lot of opportunity there in um, another aspect of man-machine interface, and that is uh, direct neural links. Uh, Elon Musk has a company, Neuro Neuralink, that he started where he's pushing. Um, I think he actually is, well, you want to do non-invasive, but I think he's looking at in evas invasive connections uh, between brain cells and, and electrodes. Um, there are other companies that have uh, non-invasive hats that you wear that have um, uh, basically uh, uh, EEG uh, electrodes. Um, and, and you can actually, uh, I'm not sure what it is you're doing, but you can, with biofeedback, you can control things on the screen uh, with, uh, with the little hats. But I think um, eventually we'll get to the point where we can do some kind of a direct uh, neural connection uh, with the brain, and uh, when that happens, I, I want to get a memory upgrade for sure. Uh, I wouldn't mind having a couple coprocessors on the side to to um, off offline uh, some computation, and uh, you know having little antennas like the my favorite Martian, so I could do uh, instant uh, wireless communication. I'd, I'd go for one of those upgrades too. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you so much.